Leaders Global Solutions presents the Subject to Talent podcast, a hub for global workforce leaders to unleash the power of human enterprise. Listen in as we explore the most innovative and transformational topics impacting businesses today. Hi, I'm Bruce Morton, the host of the Subject to Talent podcast. Today, I welcome entrepreneur Matthew Matola, who has led enterprise adoption of the human cloud, which explores how artificial intelligence and the freelance economy could transform the world of work. I look forward to chatting with you today, Matthew, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bruce. It's an absolute honor to be with you and, and on this today. Great to see you. So um, those regular listeners will know here at AGS's Subject to Talent podcast, we always start our, our each session by asking our guests the same first question. And that is, how did you get into the workforce industry? Um, and I'll add on to that a little bit for you. Um, and what inspired you to develop the workforce plan for freelancers? Oof, oof. So I would, I would phrase it with the question of, am I in the talent industry and in the workforce industry? Oh, the, reason, the reason I say that, yeah, the reason <laughs> I say that is because I had a sort of seminal moment happen in 2012, a long way back, right? right? And that was that I was consulting and freelancing myself, thinking it was a side thing that I would grow up and, and grow out of. And I went into the big four and I realized real quick that this is not going to work for me. Now, mm-hmm. at the time, it was very much a, oh, this is, you know, this, this, this way of working shouldn't exist. But now I look at it and say, it's great in some ways, but for someone that really wanted to make an impact, this, this isn't going to work for me. And I think a lot of the behind the data that you look at in terms of half the workforce wanting to work for themselves, right? You look at over half of millennials and Gen Z already doing it. Right. It's mostly because we want to make an impact. So how did I get into the world of talent? I had that aha moment. I then didn't give up in terms of I went to San Francisco and Silicon Valley to work at one of the first uh, remote software development platforms called Gigster. I then went to Microsoft to build the freelance toolkit and really help them drive their freelance program. And I just haven't stopped believing in this kind of crazy world of self-employment, freelance, and digital talent platforms. Great. Good response. Thank you. So um, so let's start at the beginning then with a description of so-called gig economy, freelance, and everything else. Uh, how do we... Give us a quick thumb sketch view of the where we've got to and how we've got to today in that in that space. So, Bruce, something you told me actually, I always keep in back of mind. By the way, is it's it's always been here, right? Like 2019, people were talking about it, but it's been in the too hard bucket, right? right. So, I preface it by saying nothing is really that new, especially the technology. But if I were to have to give like a lay of the land history of this world. Mm-hmm. You know, as as early as the Middle Evil Ages, right? Freelancers were mercenaries, right? Like, let's go get a couple of freelancers. It's always existed. Self-employment always existed. But then around 2012, 2016, you start to see remote work and remote technologies make self-employment easier, right? And so mm-hmm. as early as early 2000s, you do see like Elance, Odesk, freelance platforms. But around 2012, 2016, it starts to become effective when you see like Microsoft Teams, Google, uh, Google Workspace, and the various collaboration tools. Now, I'll give you a quick history. 2016, mm-hmm. merger of Elance and Nodesk into Upwork. You start to see freelancer.com, Fiverr, those. 2018, 2019, Upwork IPOs, Fiverr IPOs. Around 2020 and 21, okay, you see this crazy thing called COVID. Then you start to see things like Great Resignation. You see all the recent Gen I LLMs. You see a very uncertain economy, and we now sit in a world where I think the individuals have clearly chosen self-employment, not all, but a good amount, meaning here in Europe, right, you see between 10 and 50 million in the U.S., over 40 million full-time self-employed people. Um, But so that's a kind of quick history, though, by the way, is like, it's never not existed. It's just gotten so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way of setting it. I think the, as you said, they've always been there, but freelancers were a bit of an anomaly that perhaps used to do a lot of marketing, creative design stuff. People, that's how they thought of a freelancer. But now organizations, we're certainly seeing 
they are proactively thinking of this group of people as a as a proactive sourcing channel to get to great talent. H- how has that evolution happened? Is I mean, you talked about some of the technology platforms and the ability for the work of the individual to collaborate on technology platforms like Teams, et cetera. Do you think those have just given this cohort more exposure and that's why enterprises are now taking them seriously? I, it's a good question. I, so we actually use this and it depends on the region, but here in, I'm in Germany right now for a, you know, talking with over 300 executives. One of the things we say is that freelance actually is not outside of the box. It's the 5% on the fringes still in the okay. box, but it's right. on the fringes. Right. And yeah. we say that the box is the contingent talent spend that already exists. And if you're looking at a Fortune 500, that's what, $1 to $5 billion. Then if you look at that $1 to $5 billion, between 60 and 80% is pretty much unmanaged, right? It's not, it's not properly centrally managed. And then of that, 5 to 10% is this freelance spend, which usually means platform slash unmanaged independent contributor type spend. Now, where it's changed, and this is what's so tough about this industry, is that it's usually not, let's go build a better talent strategy. It's usually someone in the working team or someone who's owning a product or innovation or marketing budget. And freelance is just a better way to help them drive efficiency, growth, and innovation. And so what's really tough about that is it's been like these quick, or not these quick, it's been these big wins, but it hasn't been that gradual linear process Unlike if you look at like number of freelancers growing, that looks pretty consistent. That looks like a 30 to 100% growth year over year. Right. But with companies, it still sits in that innovation fringe, usually outside of the VMS, MSP, and typical contingent talent program. Right. So we're going to dig into a bit more of that later. But the, I guess you should, let's kick off here. Let, tell us about your company um, and the human cloud concept. So, Okay. I like to think the industry grows, we grow. Um, We are an advisory firm and a research firm at the intersection of technology and work. We very strategically say technology and work because the terms, it depends who's paying what they use. So one company here in Europe would say we have a borrow strategy. Another would say we have a freelance strategy. Another an on-demand talent strategy, right? Right? So many, so many different terms. We don't care as long as the supply is self-employed and technology is at the core of the mediation, meaning the sourcing, the paying, the managing, you name it. With that said, we serve two people really well. We help companies be strategic about their freelance programs. So we help them go from an idea up to a million, 50 million, 100 million in spent. And then we help the industry from a growth perspective. And by industry, there's over 800 of these talent platforms. Most of them are bootstrapped. Most of them struggle to get their voice heard just because like, they're bootstrapped, but they're really, really good businesses at 20 to $100 million and they have incredible retention and growth per account. So we kind of serve those two of, hey, companies be strategic about freelance and industry. Let's get you into those enterprises. But hmm. we like to say- Yeah, and, and you mentioned you were in Germany and this prompted this question. Um, so- if we take like one of the big folks like Upwork, you know, they you might be in North America using the platform, but the worker could be anywhere in the world. Effectively, is that are you seeing the same thing in Europe, or is it more localized? If you're on a German platform, you probably find German workers living in Germany. Or is is there much of a difference there? I'll give you the full regional rundown. You ready? So right. in the U.S., right in the U.S., we generally want cheaper or the smartest people. And we're actually okay with where they sit. We do like English and we do like time zones. Um, In Europe, localization is very important. And if you look at one of the larger platforms like Malt versus an Upwork or Fiverr, and you look at their go-to-market and their uh, service structure, Malt would say, this is our UK office. This is our Germany office. This is our France office. They have a very much localized approach. So that is very true. With that said, though, if you look at Europe, the maturity goes UK, France, and Germany. And Eastern Europe, though, is actually growing faster than the ones that are already mature. And Mm -hmm. so even though, kind of like the US, right, where we're a bunch of different countries inside one, 
Europe's also that way and <laughs> dealing with talent, they don't all deal with it the same way and some yeah. be better than yeah. others. Yeah. Interesting. And for those organizations that are more forward thinking or perhaps got into this world a lot qu quicker than others, what are some of the advantages that they're seeing by engaging these freelancers and, and actually formalizing this approach and this talent pool as opposed to it being more ad hoc and perhaps rogue spend as, as you mentioned earlier yeah i'll um you know it's funny i'm going to start with the why not really quickly um mm -hmm. just because i always you know i started in, in tech and sales to be honest so for me if no one's not if if they're not taking action on something else then it doesn't matter right and so right. in terms of the why not if they do nothing then we are seeing really strong competitive forces that are really hurting the business. So for example, if they're not shipping on time, if they don't get something out within six months, they're seeing 50% loss in anticipated revenue. And so, and then if they're not shipping on time, and if you look at obviously cloud computing and, and, and what we call even cloud, but so the startups are able to outcompete them. So you're seeing a lot of industries that they are totally getting eaten up by these smaller ones. Now the benefits, and there's two levels of this. The quick answer, right? If you want a really, really quick win, speed, cost, quality. Speed, averaging two to five days to get anyone in the building, right? They're, these are abundant talent pools. Cost, 30 up until 90% cost savings. No one's going to say 90 because then their PR team freaks out, but <laughs> even up to 90, right? And then quality, and this is one where, okay, I can teach you how to game it, but quality, you're going to see over 95% of whatever it is, whether it's reviews or CSAT or, or whatever it is. Now, the bigger thing though, is we always say it's actually more about efficiency, growth, and innovation. Efficiency are the first two things that I told you about. Growth, new markets, and new people to serve those markets. So if you want to get into, let's say, Singapore or Philippines or you name it, you can have localized talent. So you can have growth into there. Right. Also, you can get into new markets. And so Airbnb did actually show, I don't know if you saw this, Bruce, but so um, Southeast Asia and Latam are their two most, uh, most fastest growing regions right now. So if you're sitting in the US, Germany, you better be having a, a, an ability to tap into those markets. And then from an innovation perspective, there's literally brand new business models. There's new product lines. There's new service lines. Freelance in itself is a market. And so you can totally disrupt yourself and have a brand new product line, service line, business model, 100% because of freelance. And one quick, quick example of that is TurboTax Live. Right. So everyone in the US, you're starting to freak out come December, also because of your taxes. And TurboTax figured out they could get a, a, a CPA or accountant freelancer within 30 seconds. Right. That's, that's a massive disruption. If you look at their stock yeah. price, things are good. So th those are the benefits. Yeah. So what would you advise be for folks that are listening in that perhaps it's a, you know, head of a function, a hiring manager, per se, that's the, yeah, I, how do I convince my organization that we should take this more strategically? And, you know, what's the starting point to try and create and generate some of that change? So I'd say first, look for something to attach to that's not freelance. Like don't fall in love with freelance. And that's why a lot of our clients love us is because we listen, we know you don't care about freelance. We don't expect you to be the freelance expert. <laughs> we'll be your independent advisor, right? So first is don't worry about, you don't have to fall in love with freelance. Um, second though, is look to something that's already broken and speak that language. So for example, if you're leading a customer support function or a customer experience function, and what you really care about is CSAT, right? Or retention or a license is bought because of this. Stick with that, right? Stick with that metric and tell your leadership that you're going to increase this by 30% or that you're going to decrease this by 30%, whichever it is, right. right? So stick with that metric. Then the second thing though that I would say is be bold. And so I'll give another example where there might be things that seem really big. And if you're sitting in an enterprise, it's usually risky, right? To talk big, but you might be able to do that. For example, hey, we're going to create a whole new business line. We're going to go create TurboTax Live. Uh, we're going to go create a whole new service line. Because of still the immaturity in this industry, it might require a big, bold leap to get the discretionary budget to try it, right? So that's the second right. thing is be bold. The third thing, which this is where good news for all you listeners is really lean into your partner. 
And so this is not like you are priority 576 of a big agency. This is like you are probably priority one to 10 if you're thinking strategic of these platforms. And so whichever talent platform you're working with and you're, and you're working with, think of them as a partner, help them drive the strategy, help them build your strategy decks, make sure you got the case studies, make sure they help you with the strategic planning, really, really lean into them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about this industry so much. They're partners, right? They're not just like another vendor. And they probably can't bring you to the baseball games, to be honest. They might not get you a suite at the Jets game, but they're really going to help you move your work forward. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. And so how are advances in technology and AI, how are they making this vision and this trend that we're seeing now, this ever-growing trend, more of a reality? What's the impact on, on this space? two things, right? There's the good, the bad. I'll start with the bad, <laughs> which uh, bad for kind of the platforms, bad for the individuals, good for the business. There's a lot of things that are just getting replaced. Um, I invested in a company around two years ago called 11x.ai. They do SDR and BDR agents, 100% digital workers. If you look at things that are very task-based, transactional, and very clear outcomes, yeah. that's probably going to be gone. So a lot of basic writing, basic logos, you name it. I like to think, to be honest, the things that already could have been automated but weren't good enough are probably going to go gone, right? So that's that's one side of it. The other side, though, is that the experiences should be frictionless and the data should compound to actually be intelligent. And what I mean by that is one of my biggest, like, I don't know, just frustrations when I started working at a company after doing, you know, way too much schooling and being way too startupy was how much of the onboarding knowledge that was not passed on. And I, I really don't know why, but when you look at certain generative AI and certain softwares, a lot of the data of what you've done prior, now it's easier to document and capture and learn from, whether it's your right. data or your other colleagues. And if you look at a freelance experience, you have to think about it holistically, meaning everything from I identify a need to this is the right pool of talent that I need to I need to repeat this and my org needs to repeat this. A lot of those processes in the traditional HR lens just don't make sense. Like right. a paper resume, do we really need that? Um, actually posting a job, do we even really need to do that if someone can identify the talent of pool that I need? So a lot of the, I don't want to say archaic, but a lot of the traditional HR processes, if you use a white piece of paper, we probably don't need them. And a lot of the platforms are saying things like a frictionless freelance experience. And you use the term platform then. I'd love to get your take on, because there are many different terms thrown around in this space, and some of them mean the same, some of them mean different FMS, engagement platforms. How do you define, are there differences in those two? And how, in your world, when you're advising clients, how do you differentiate them? So we have 11 different segments. So oh. if you were to say what's a freelance, okay, we you have go. 11. I know, it's very <laughs> painful, but very, very painful. But yeah. here's, a, here's the top ones, you ready? So we start with platform, we then go into provider, we then go into service. So platform, we're talking about a large horizontal platform or we're talking about a vertical niche specialized platform. Large, those are the big ones, right? That's right. the Upwork, the Fivers, they have absolutely everything. Niche ones, those are the ones that are really, really good at a specific industry skill set, and at times even region. So for example, there's one called Habrati based out of Saudi Arabia. They're the best at working with Saudi Arabia, right? So, so niche. And they actually yeah. help other platforms work with Saudi Arabia. There's another one here in the US called Uncompany for Design. And so platform, right? Large horizontal and small niche specialized. Okay, now we look at providers. You have FMSs. You have the traditional MSPs, right? You have the compliance, you have the EOR, VOR, AOR, probably pick another letter up front and you'll hear it next week. Um, but so that's sort of the, okay, platform into provider. Then when you look at services, you have people like us, which are actually gonna educate you and teach you what is freelance, what is a freelance strategy. And not to get too complicated, Bruce, but we've only talked about the B2B right. side of this, meaning selling in a B2B. So there's also 
its own industry is the B2C side of freelance. When we talk about like collective, Lethos, a bunch of other business to freelancer tools. Got it. So the if you're an enterprise looking to put your toe in the water, would you suggest starting with the platforms or the providers? Both. Um, I would actually start with, I, I know, I would, I would start with the pain and yeah. then I would okay. go with what are we currently doing? Yeah. yeah. And, and I would even say, I would think from finding on or finding, vetting, onboarding, managing, paying, I would break it up by the specific use case slash yeah. outcome that you need. And then most likely there's a, a, a specialized platform for each one. And I would never say just stick with one. I would say set up meetings with all of them and start to pilot with all of them. Have you seen any examples of aggregation yet where, again, from an enterprise lens, they want to use different special speciality for marketing and for IT, and but there isn't one that does it all. So is there a way of aggregating um, if they're going to you know, integrate with a VMS or something? Yeah, there's uh there are and there's been multiple for me as early as 2016. And yeah. uh and remember I started in San Francisco, right? So the Uberification and the Amazonification, like that's all everyone could think about. The problem that we see with this aggregation, and uh oh, actually I'll give you what's what's happening in terms of where the success comes from. Successful aggregation that we've seen has actually mostly came from platform to platform or traditional vendor to platform. So platform to platform mm -hmm. looks like small niche specialized. One wins the work, the others subcontract with that or yep. work in a relationship with. The big to small looks exactly like that, right? It looks like probably you having another freelance vendor and kind of sharing terms. Um, right. but so we've seen a lot of aggregation. Where I've seen it break is that the industry and the actual freelancer experience, it's not standardized enough that a hiring manager knows how to go from, I have this pain up until this is the person or this is the outcome that I need. And so what happens is you try to aggregate all of these individuals or all these freelance platforms, but you haven't solved the core issue of enable a hiring manager to scale mm -hmm. the outcomes that they need. And so I've seen multiple attempts, and this is why Human Cloud, we have not laid a line of software into that or the freelancer experience because we do it 100% manually. And because we do, you know, we do that for our clients, we do 100% manually just because I don't, I don't know how to standardize it yet. My, maybe I'm not a good enough CEO, but I, I don't know how to standardize it yet. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. To be interested to watch, see how that evolves. So. Um, last time we chatted, you mentioned uh, anchovies, <laughs> and I was intrigued. So I'd love you to share that with our listeners, uh, the story you told me about how you think about that. <laughs> so you know what I've learned, by the way, since we had our first keynote on Thursday, is uh, here in Germany, at least, it's not anchovies, it's the train system. But so the, <laughs> There you go. The, yeah, right? The, the overall sort of uh, coming back to why not, right? The overall thing that we tell leaders, whether it's CEOs, VPs, you name it, is if you don't have a talent strategy today, you're going to be stuck with anchovies tomorrow. And whatever we want to call them, anchovies, the train system, what we mean by that is the B players, the C players. Now, for me as an entrepreneur and someone that from you know the second I started working was like impact, 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 I really didn't understand why it seemed like the corporate incentive structure was to just not get fired and not take risks. Cause I was like, let me make an impact. Right. Right. What I've learned by navigating freelance and, and corporate is that freelancers, all they care about is making an impact. They are the A players and the best freelancers are usually the best employees. And especially now, if you look at the rise of fractional, um, these individuals look like the five to 15 year they'd be the quickest promoted, but they're choosing an independent career path over freelance. So the A players are increasingly freelance. And if you look at MBO Partners' recent study that literally came out this week, the data is there, right? The proof is there. Now what's different is cloud computing, if you were late to it, then you just got cheaper software, meaning, okay, you used right. AWS, yep. you used Azure, right? Things were cheaper. 
the human cloud, freelancers don't want to change their clients. It's one of the biggest myths. So if you're not actively investing in a freelance strategy right now and building your talent pools, they're not going to want to work with you. And so you're literally going to be fishing with B and C players. You can call them anchovies here in Germany. They said to use the train station. They also said to use North American beers as an analogy too. <laughs> um, but, but so, and, and, and I'll tell you, and I'll give you one quick story. So, you know, when I was 24 and I was living in a living room in Silicon Valley, I kind of inherently knew like, if I want to do more, I have to go hire people, right? Like I think every leader inherently understands they can't do it themselves. But I had no money and I was 24. So <laughs> I couldn't say, hey, I want a headgown, right? Um, instead, though, since I freelanced, I knew about these platforms. So what did I do? I learned how to eat one meal a day and I saved up. So I had a thousand bucks a month. I then went and I hired a designer. Okay. I then went and, and wanted to build a report on the future of, of, of how AI is impacting work. So I went to these platforms. And I found one of the early deep learning experts. His name was Matt Coatney. He ended up becoming my co-author for the book. And right. so if you look at the, these younger yep. leaders, it's just second nature to us, right? It's not about getting headcount. It's not yep. about looking like we have a big team. Most of us just want the impact. So that's the anchovy reference is you're going to be stuck with B players. Yeah. I know that sounds really rough. I'll probably get yelled at by some people about this, but it's fine. No, that's cool. That's great. Thank you. It, it, uh, it's, a, it's a good analogy because it brings it home. And by the way, us old folks as well, when I wrote my first book in 2019, I used Fiverr for a designer that cost me about a twentieth of what it would have cost in the US. So I've been big fans of freelancers ever since. Um, so um, coming to an end here, this has been great, great conversation, very enlightening. Um, and I'm sure our listeners will uh, have learned a lot from this. And I'll get you at the end to uh, give you a contact details. So I think you'll get some reach outs. But I just want to wrap up here with a look into the future, as always, the crystal ball question. Where do you see the future of enterprises engaging freelance market and platforms in, let's say, five years from now? I see it. And I'm going to, I'm going to give an answer based off the data in terms of the data and just trying to be as simple as possible, to be honest. It's going to have to be decentralized in a way that legal and HR understand it being centralized. I know that sounds very complicated. What I mean by that is the, the five to 15 year leaders need to be empowered with budget and less restrictions about what that budget goes to, but rather more strict on the outcomes that they produce. It simply has to go that way. The reason I say that is because freelance as a concept and even talent, it's just so broad and so general and so not sexy that your future leaders do not care about your talent strategy. They do not care about creating a job wreck, right? No one, okay, not no one, but a product marketing and innovation leader does not care where the talent's coming from, how they got it there. They just want the best people and the best job. Yeah. These talent platforms are incredible at doing that, but they require budget and investment and autonomy to run the teams they want to run their teams. Now, obviously, that's not that that freaks the chief procurement officer out, right? It's like telling a CIO, CTO, use whatever system you want. It just it freaks them out. So there is going to have to be centralization on the legal aspects of this, the compliance aspects of this, the privacy and security. So that is real. But with that said, companies that want to stay relevant, they need to access top talent. Top talent is in these independent freelance right. pools. So you need to give your up and coming leaders, you just need to give them budget and hold them accountable to outcomes, right? Like don't just give them money for tree yeah. houses and fun stuff, like hold them accountable to outcomes, but literally decentralize the budgets to enable them to do what they think is best. Great. Love that answer. Thanks, you, Matthew. So um, how can listeners find you and uh, learn more about you? At LinkedIn, last name is Matola, M-O-T-T-O-L-A, Matthew, pretty simple. Um, our email, at Bruce, I've, I've, uh, we, boy, we learned some SEO mistakes. It is Matthew at humancloud.work. So uh, uh, trying, to get, trying to get a passport and saying that my last name is dot .work or my email is dot .work, pretty <laughs> difficult. But for you listeners out there, it's Matthew at humancloud.work or just go straight to humancloud.work. 
Uh, we have a podcast as well, not as good as yours, Bruce, but uh, more narrative <laughs> freelance. But um, so, yeah, so Human Cloud podcast is everywhere. Human Cloud podcast, humancloud.work, Matthew at humancloud.work, LinkedIn. Awesome. You name it. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Really enjoyed the conversation today. Appreciate you. Of course. Thanks for having me, Bruce. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have questions, please send them to subject to talent at elitistglobalsolutions.com. Follow us on LinkedIn with the hashtag subject to talent and learn more about AGS at elitistglobalsolutions.com, where you can find additional workforce insights and past episodes. Until next time, cheers. Cheers.